course, that we're, we, I mean, we started off in the beginning talking about the relational model and uh, SQL, and now we're going from the, the bottom to the top of the stack, and we're, we're sort of describing all the things you need to build at each individual layer. And the idea is that these abstraction layers inside of our database system are going to allow us to change how we implement different parts of the system uh, without generally affecting the, uh, you know, the, the different layers. So we're at the middle now where we're going to start talking about access methods. And access methods are the way that the other parts of the system are going to be reading and writing or accessing the actual underlying data. And these access methods are going to be using the buffer pool manager to get memory pages, and the buffer pool manager uses the disk manager to get uh, to move things on and off a disk. So for this week, we're going to talk about two different types of data structures. Uh, today's class will be about hash tables, and then on, uh, on, on, on Wednesday's class, we'll talk about trees. And it's important as we go along to understand that these different classes of data structures make different trade-offs, make different, different design decisions that uh, will have different implications on how we can use them inside of our database system. So the, these data structures in particular will be used in sort of four different scenarios, or four different areas of, of the system. So first is that we can use them for internal metadata, internal information about the database system keeping track of what queries are running, what data it's stored, what indexes it has, things like that. Uh, and this is essentially the extendable hash table that you guys are building for your first project, right? This is not exposed to you in the application. This is something the database system is maintaining on the inside to keep track of what pages that it has. Then there's sort of what these call, are called core data, data structures where it's the way we're going to organize pages, for example. We showed this before when you can, you can maintain your heaps as a bunch of linked lists. It's essentially a data structure that's maintaining the, those pages. Then the, the next class of, of usage would be uh, what are called temporary data structures. And this is where the database system will build a instantiate a data structure on the fly to help it aid in doing some kind of operation, some kind of maintenance. So for example, if you need to join two tables together, one particular type of algorithm will build a hash table on the fly, populate it with the data from the tables you're trying to join, and then when that query is done, it throws that hash table away. And it rebuilds it every single time you, 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 you run a, a, you know, that, that join algorithm. We can use it for other things like doing aggregations, finding just, uh, distinct, distinct elements, things like that. And the last one that, that people are probably most familiar with when you think of data structures inside of database systems, and that's using them for table indexes. Right? Think of this as the glossary in your textbook in the back that allows you to find for a particular keyword, jump to the exact location in the book where that information or that, that, that keyword is referenced. And so this is the same kind of thing we're going to have in our database system using these data structures, whether it's a tree or a hash table, that's going to allow us to jump to pages that have the tuples that have the values that we're looking for. So for, for today's class, we're, we're going to focus at a high level uh, how to build these hash tables. We're not talking talk about in particular instances of when you want to use them. And again, using the extendable hash table for the page directory uh, in the first assignment is one instantiation of using a hash table. Uh, but as we go out through the semester, we'll, we'll, they'll come up over and over again in different scenarios. We can use them to help us find the, the data that we need or organize our data. So when we build a data structure in our database system or we would choose a data structure to use in our database system, uh, there's two different uh, design decisions we have to consider. The first is just roughly how we're actually going to organize the data. And this is essentially how we're going to lay out the data in such a way that it's going to make it efficient for us to access this. And again, because we're focusing on a disk-oriented architecture in this course, the, the underlying, uh, if, 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 the, if the data structure needs to be backed by disk, then we need to organize our data in terms of pages. If it's an ephemeral thing that's going to sit in memory, then we don't really care because if it's in memory, then it's byte addressable. But we need to do it again, do it in such a way based on what assumptions we have of how the, the data structure will be stored. Then there's a whole other uh, class of design decisions we have to make uh, to deal with concurrency. So this is if you have multiple threads running at the same time inside the database system accessing this, the same data structure, we want to make sure that they don't get interfere with each other and we don't 
end up with an incorrect state or inconsistent state of our data structure. It's actually even more complicated than that because not only do, you, do we need to worry about threads possibly reading and writing the same regions of memory in our data structure at the same time, we also need to worry about the logical contents of the data structure if we're using them in, in, in for transactions to make sure that they have a consist consistent view of the database. Again, this won't be an issue for what we're going to talk about in this class. This will come up later when we talk about concurrency control and transactions. But the way to think about this is that there's the physical structure of the data, the physical contents of the data structure, then there's also the logical contents. And so in this lecture and this week, we'll focus on the, the physical structure, make, make sure we protect that. We'll talk about the logical stuff l later in the semester. Again, in fact, I think we have a whole, whole lecture just dealing with concurrency control inside of indexes to deal with this problem, because it's a very complicated thing. Um, and it's, a, it's a, most courses actually overlook it. All right, so the, again, so today's class we're focusing on, on hash tables. So at a high level, the way to think about a hash table, and again, if you've taken any basic CS intro course or, or data structure course, we should all be familiar with this. Um, but the way we'll define it is that a hash table essentially implements a associative array API that's going to allow us to map keys to particular values. And the way we're going to do this is that we're going to have some kind of hash function, which I won't define now, but I'll define later, that will take that key and then do some math on it and we can compute an offset in the hash table to find that, or the, the array that, to find the element that we're looking for. So the, the, the most basic type of hash table you can have is was what's called a, a static hash table. And again, think of the static hash table, which is you malloc a giant array in memory, and then for each, uh, each offset in that array will be one particular element in, in your hash table. So for a given key, if you want to find it, you just take the hash of the key that you want, mod n by the mod it by the number of elements you have in your, in your array, and then you can jump to the, the exact location that you're looking for. Right, and so in this case here, I could put in elements like this. So here I'm assuming that they're all fixed length, so I know I need to allocate, in this case here, uh, uh, three, or three eight bytes for every, every um, sorry, three bytes for every element I want to store in my string. Um, but this only works if, you, if your elements are fixed, fixed length, so if they're variable length, then in your array will essentially just be 64-bit pointers to point to some other memory location that will actually have the real value that you're looking for. Right? So this is, this is at a high level essentially what we're trying to do. And then we'll show different data structures that can, can do different things and handle different, different scenarios and make different trade-offs to do some things better than another. So with the static hash table, what are some obvious problems with this? What's that? Sorry. Hash conflicts is one. What else? What's that? Scalability. Scalability. In terms of what, though? Actually, this is perfectly scalable, right? Like, this is, this is the best, actually, this is the best you can actually do. Space usage. Space, space utilization, yeah, that, that's, a, that, that's a big part of it, yes. What else? Exactly, the number of elements is static, and there's one more. Okay, and this I assume that all of the keys are unique, right? So the three assumptions in the static hash table that are problems is that the first one is that we have to know all the elements we're going to have ahead of time. Some cases you, you will know this, and that's okay. Other cases, you don't. Uh, and so sort of he was saying if, if you make an assumption that you know the number of elements, in this case here, say n is infinity, if I just malloc the, jump, most, the biggest array that I could ever have, and if I only have four elements in it, then you're just wasting all the space. The second assumption that we made is that each key is unique. Now, in some instances of a hash table, this is okay, right? In your, in your page directory, in your, in, your, uh, in your buffer pool manager, every page ID is guaranteed to be unique. So th this is fine. But because we want to use these for possibly table indexes in our database, they're not always guaranteed to have, be unique. And so uh, this, doesn't, this won't work for us because we'll have collisions uh, and we won't be able to handle that. This also assumes that we have what is called a, a we can have some collisions on the same key, but we can also have collisions on two different keys, both getting mapped to the same value. So in this particular example here, I have what is called a perfect hash function, 
which is guarantees that if you have two keys that are distinct, then their hashes for whatever hash function I use, they will also be distinct. Right? But we'll see that this is hard to do if you don't know the number of elements you're going to have ahead of time. So people spend a lot of time coming up with different hash functions to try to re reduce this collision rate uh, or getting close to being a perfect hash, hash function without actually being one. So this is, this is essentially what we're going to try to solve today. Right? The static hash table is actually the fastest way you can do this, but it wastes memory and doesn't handle conflicts and all these other issues. And so we're going to first start talking about the chain hash table, which is, which is sort of the most, second most basic hash function you can have. Um, but then as we go along, we'll discuss all the different problems. You can have each of these and refine them and get better better approaches. And then we have time finishing up at the end. We'll talk about how to actually choose your hash function. All right? All right, so sort of the way to think about this is the first three will be sort of fixed size hash tables where you know the number of elements you're going to have. The second two will be dynamic hash tables where you don't know the number of elements. And then we have a sort of intelligent way to grow the hash table uh, up or down based, based, on, uh, based on the number of things we have. All right, so the first ha hash table, the first sort of static hash table we can have is a chain hash, hash table. So chain hashing is essentially what everyone thinks of when you think of a hash table, right? Um, this, is, this, is what, you know, this is what you get in Java if you allocate a hash map. They essentially use the this, this same, same data structure here. And the idea is that uh, you're going to have a, a, an array of pointers, and those pointers are going to point to a, uh, at each offset, point to a linked list of buckets. And these buckets can have multiple entries where you're going to store all the elements that hash to that particular bucket. Um, if you want to handle unique keys, then uh, you, you, need to be, you, handle, you, you need to be careful how you do this. And there's two different approaches I'll show at the end. Um, but the basic idea is that if you hash to uh, a bucket, if you want to do an insert, then you just insert it to the end of the bucket. If, it's, if, if you want to, yeah. if you don't care whether it's unique, you insert it to the end. If you do care it's unique, you have to do a linear scan to find whether the key is already there. Uh, and then do a lookup is basically this, the same thing. So a really simple example looks like this. Again, we have an array. Of, of offsets, and these offsets are just 64-bit pointers to some, some, some buckets, right? And these buckets usually are, are, are the size of a page, right? Because you may want to spill this to disk. Um, and then if I want to do an insert into a, a bucket that's already full, then I just extend the chain out, add a new bucket, and then I can insert my new, new entry there. So now the key thing to understand here is that inside of the in uh, each element in a bucket, we need to store both the key and the value. Right? And the reason we have to do this is because we can have two different keys get mapped to the same bucket, even though they're distinct. And when we're doing our lookup to find our entry, we need to make sure whether we're actually dealing with the entry that corresponds to our key. Right? And again, we, we, if, say we want to delete an entry, right? or delete, delete a key, we want to go look in our, in, you know, in our buckets and do our matching, make sure we actually delete the right value. All right? This is pretty straightforward. This is pretty easy. Um, the downside, though, of chain hashing is that the hash table essentially can grow infinitely along the bucket list, right? Because if everybody keeps hashing to the same bucket, if you have a bad hash function, then that, that, that bucket chain keeps growing forever. Right? And then that makes essentially your, your data structure just the same thing as a sequential scan or a linear search. Because right? you would hash the key, land to the head of the bucket chain, and then now you need to do a linear search between every single bucket to find all your keys. Right? So if every single element hashes to the same bucket list, it's the same thing as a sequential scan, and you're building a hash table for nothing. Um, to make sure that this is uh, protected, though, we have multiple threads. All you need to do is just take, a, take a, a latch on each bucket and then make whatever change or do whatever operation it is that, that you want to do on them. You don't need to hash the, the entire thing. So to handle uh, non-unique keys, the, uh, there's two ways we can do this. The first is that we can just maintain a separate linked list for every key of all their different values. Right, so let's say that we have our bucket and we have two keys x, y, x, y, z, and a, b, c. Instead of actually inlining in the different values in each element in the bucket, it's just a 64-bit pointer to some other page 
that has all the values for each corresponding key. Right, so now if I want to say, you know, find whether this key exists, I only need to look at one entry in, in my bucket. Or sorry, I, I need to scan the bucket list. I don't need to go through all the individual values. Right, so this will make searching much more quickly. But what are some downsides of this? Yes? Right, he says you might have to follow a pointer to a different page. Exactly right. What's another problem? If I have only one value for a particular key, then I'm allocating an entire page for that, just that one value. Now you may be, you know, try to do something a bit tricky and say, all right, well, if I have a, um, maybe what I'll do is I'll inline the, the, the value in, in the bucket, and then if I go to two values, maybe then I'll split it off and put a little flip bit to say, go look in this value list. But then now you're making this all more complicated because you're adding different rules and conditional rules to make this thing work. So the other approach is just actually store the, the duplicate key, keys and values together in the bucket, right, in this case here, uh, for X, Y, X, Y, Z, and A, B, C, the different buckets are just interleaved with their, with their uh, the different combinations of their values, right? So the downside of this is that we're storing the key multiple times. So if it's a large key, then we're wasting space, but the, um, the, the upside is that, or the, the, the advantage over the other approach is that now you don't need to go follow other pointers potentially to go find all the values for a particular key. And you're, you're not really wasting that space because presumably your buckets will be um, mostly full. Right, so this is another example of like, there's all of these different trade-offs in, in computer science, especially in databases, where you, you know, there's no one exact answer you say, you know, that solves all your problems. Right, there's always going to be uh, downsides and positives for each of these things. As far as I know, most systems do the bottom approach, right? Nobody really does the top one, but you could do the top one if you wanted to. Yes? Do we assume like each top end bucket has a fixed base? His question is, are we assuming that each, um, sorry, each, 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 each entry, uh, in this case here, um, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is what if you need to look at bitmap. Bitmap, if like that's the variable list, and we need a bitmap to the page of each entry. Oh, so his, his statement is um, it's not a bitmap, right? The statement is you need to know what the offset is, or you need uh, you need an offset array. Yeah. yeah. So correct. Yes, yeah. so you have to, and so you could do this by storing um, either separate array, or you could just scan linearly, and then the beginning of each. Um, of each entry has is prefixed with the length of that of the of the value, so you know how to jump over it if, to find the next element. You also said it is stored in the yes, correct, yes. I spilled water, but I don't think I don't think so. We'll be fine. Okay. Um, all right. So the the another alternative to the chain hash table, another basic hash table implementation, is called open addressing hashing. Um, and basically, instead of having the array point to, to different buckets, lists, you just have one giant array, and then you inline the actual values that you, uh, the key values inside the, that single array. And so what happens is the way you handle collisions is that when you hash your key, you'll land some offset in this giant array, and if something's already there and it doesn't have the same key that you're looking for, then you have to keep jumping down uh, into the into the into the array, looking at the next element, to you find either an entry slot, empty slot, meaning like you you've looked at everything, or you loop back around and you know you've scanned the entire thing, right? So let's look, look at this example. So again, we have our uh, we have some th this separate array that has these offsets for our, for our hash keys, right? And so say for the x, it would go here. Right, just hash it and it lands on some offset. Y goes there. But now let's say Z, we want to insert it and it hashes to the same location where X is. And so when we land there, we see this slot's already taken in our array. So then we just jump down to the next one and, and take that one. Right, and again, so now if you want to do a lookup on Z, you do the lookup and you land on X, it's not the thing you're looking for, jump down, you would find Z, and then that's, that's the thing you want. 
let's say that there's W and W maps to the same location, you look as X, you land there, it's not the same, skip that, go to Z, it's not the same, skip that, and then the next one would be empty, so you know that W wouldn't exist. So who thinks this is a good idea versus who thinks this is a bad idea? There's a lot of water here, sorry. That's probably not good. Okay. But go ahead, sorry. So his, his statement is, assuming your load factor, the fill factor, right, is good, then this would be better than the, the, the hash chain one. Right, because what will happen is, uh, right, you don't have to follow pointers along the bucket list. Um, we're not even, you know, we won't get into this now, but if it's an in-memory database, and then now you're bringing things that are in the same cache line, so that's really, really fast, right? Yes? Correct. You have the problem of that if it's not in the table, you basically do a linear scan across all elements and then to, to, to find out that it didn't exist, right? So the way you sort of have to handle that is that you want to allocate your your hash table to be a little bit, you know, larger than maybe the actual number of elements you think there's going to be there so that you at least have some empty gaps, right, that can sort of short circuit the search. Okay. So again, this is everything that we said before, that essentially to reduce the number of wasteful comparisons, then uh, we want to avoid collisions on hash, in the hash keys, because again, we'll have X and Z mapping to the same location, even though they're actually distinct values. Um, so typically what you need to do is you need to allocate your hash table to be approximately two times the number of elements you expect there to be. And that ensures that at least there's always going to be, for every single slot, there'll be some gap that comes after after it. Yes. Didn't like the influx TV guy say that they do something like this, but then they use a balloon filter to just like check for all the flaws. I mean, for the video Right. So his statement is the influx DB guys talked about how that they do something similar to allocating two X, right? Well, which is the next hash table we'll talk about. Um, but then they also use a bloom filter to probe to probe before they check the hash table to see whether something actually exists. Correct. So we'll see the balloon filter approach when we talk about hash joins, right? You still need a hash table behind the balloon filter, but you can build a balloon filter ahead of it. Correct. Yeah, the balloon filter will always say, will, will, could give you false positives and it'll never give you false negatives, right? So we'll cover that when we call, talk about hash joins. Okay. So this idea that we can, if we allocate a, a hash table between two times the amount of, of, of elements we expect to be there, uh, we can actually extrapolate this a little bit further and actually be a bit smarter about how we allocate this memory uh, and actually just maintain two separate hash tables with two separate hash functions. Right? In, in the open dressing case, I use a single hash function, I jump to some, some, some location, and then I hope that either I find the thing I'm looking for or I hit a, an empty slot to know I can terminate my search right, right then and there. Um, but if we just add a separate hash function, then we can actually improve the likelihood that we're actually going to find a, an empty slot or find the element that we're looking for in less time. So this is essentially what a cuckoo hashing does for us. So with cuckoo hashing, we're going to maintain multiple hash tables, and we're going to use multiple hash functions for each of those hash tables, and then what will happen is we'll check the both two of the both hash tables to see we can, particular key to see whether either one of them has the has the thing that we're looking for. So for for our example, I'm just going to assume we only have two hash functions and two hash tables. But there's no reason you couldn't have three, four, or more. But in general, most of the times people only only use two. So again, on insert, we'll check both tables see which other one has a free slot, and we'll, we'll, we'll start our entry there. And then we want to do uh, a lookup. We do the same thing. We hash both of them, see whether they have the thing that we, that we want. Right? And we're always guaranteed in our lookups that uh, when we hash your location, it's always going to have the uh, either it'll be in the first one or the second one or not there at all. Right? We don't need to keep searching and do our scanning the way we do in open, open addressing. 
But the issue is now if we do an insert and both tables, those slots are occupied, we need to pick one as, as, as our victim and we'll steal their slot and then rehash it and put it somewhere else in the other tables. So let's, let's go through an example. All right, again, for again, I have two hash tables. They're going to have two separate hash functions. So the first thing I want to do is, is insert X. And so I'll, I'll hash it with both my hash functions, hash one, hash two, and they land to different locations in, in these different hash tables. And then I'll flip a coin and pick the, the first one to, to, to store my value. Now I want to insert Y, same thing. I'll hash it twice use, using the two different hash functions. Um, in this case here, for the first hash function, it, ma it maps to the same location as X, which is the last thing I just inserted. Uh, so I don't want to put anything there. But then in the second hash function, it maps to an empty slot in the second hash table. So I can go ahead and insert Y there. That's fine. So now, again, if I want to do a lookup on, say, Y, I'll apply both these hash functions again. And then I'll see that in the case of the first hash table, I'll, since I'm storing the key in there, I'll see that it's not the key that I'm looking for. So I know that's not what I want. But if I go to the second hash table, I'll find the actual element that I'm looking for. All right? So now let's see what happens when we have collisions. We try to insert an entry, and both slots are already taken. So say I want to insert Z. And again, both the hash functions end up mapping to the location X in the first hash table and the location of Y in the second hash table. So I have to flip a coin now and pick one of them to, to evict. And essentially, Z is going to steal their, steal their slot. So let's say that I choose to steal uh, Y slot in the second hash table. So I'm going to put Z in there and then come back now and apply the first hash function on Y to flip it back over here. So this is where you get the name cuckoo hash. Right, because you're sort of, you know, like a cuckoo clock going back and forth between two different hash tables. So I apply the first hash function on Y. It then lands back here in X's slot. And because I know that in the case of Y, I'm, I've already taken it out of the, the second hash table, and so it has to go in this first hash table, uh, then, then Y is allowed to steal X's slot. So now Y goes there, and now I need to hash X. But now I'm using the second hash function to put it on the other side, and then it lands in a free slot there. Right? So again, the, the lookups are going to be really, really fast because I'm going to apply two hash functions, and I'm guaranteed to have to look at it right there and, and find what I'm looking for. In the case of insert, worst case scenario is that I basically reshuffle everything because if I take something out and try to put it in the other hash table, that slot's already taken. So I, then I got to take that out and probably put it into another slot. Right? So his question is, if I have, a, um, I, I have a new entry, I hash it, and I get the same entry as Z on, this, on the second hash table. Yeah. Right. So the, the, there's no guarantee that you're going to end up with a different slot on, on the first hash table. But if you choose a good hashing function that has a low collision rate, then on, you know, probabilistically, it's unlikely that you're going to end up mapping to the same thing. It can still happen, right? Uh, but mathematically, it's unlikely, right? So the thing we have to be mindful of is exactly the scenario that you're talking about is that if you basically hash everything and you realize that, oh, I'm, I'm back where I started. This is the thing I actually tried to insert the first time, right? Then you know you're stuck in an infinite loop. So when this happens, you end up having to basically just rebuild the, the, the entire table. You double the size of the hash table, and you rebuild it. Question? So his question is, what about duplicate keys? Right, so you can do the, uh, you can do the, basically the two things we talked about before. Right, you can have it be a pointer to a, a bucket link list of the values, or you can sort of try to pack them in together in, in the same slot, right? Yeah, with cuckoo hashing, it's a little bit more tricky. Yes? Back to the open addressing, I think I may have misunderstood. Were you saying that if you're looking, if you do a search and you hit an empty slot, then you can just stop searching? Correct, or, yes. But then, like, what if, you, what if there's a delete? Like, if you, like, insert X and then insert Y, and then Y is, like, the next spot after X, and then you delete X, then how do you find Y? 
Oh, yeah, 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 I see what you're saying. Oh, uh, you have to reshuffle, move, move them up. Okay, so deletion is hard. Yeah, del yes, deletion is hard, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm glossing over the details of it. There, yeah. there is some extra metadata at the store to say, like, where should I have been? Right, yeah. Um, in some cases, though, like, so um, he brings up a good point that, that I didn't mention. Some hash tables, you actually, they can support deletion, but it's slower to do. Uh, and therefore, you may not want to use them for, for everything. Right, so like if you're using for a table index, certainly you can you insert delete values all the time. So maybe open addressing is not the way to go. Uh, but if you're using it for, to do a, a join, a hash join, you build a hash table once with all the tables and then, you know all the tuples in your table, and then you just probe it nonstop. You never delete things. So open addressing actually turns out to be the best way to do this. So that's a good point. Any other questions? Okay, uh, so as I said, again, you, we, need, we need to keep track of when we do an insert, what was the thing we actually inserted, so we, if we come back around and we try to, try to reshuffle that thing again, then we know that we're stuck in infinite loop, and then we essentially have to rebuild the entire thing, right? So there is some math involved to say what's the probability that we're going to have to rebuild based on the fill factor of the, of, the, of the hash table. So with two hash functions and two hash tables, the math says you're probably not going to have to rebuild the table till it's about 50% full. With three hash functions, then you probably don't need to uh, rebuild until it's about 90% full. And again, rebuilding a hash table is really expensive, especially in this case here, because essentially you're, you know, you're allocating another, you know, huge, huge blocks of memory, and you're making just another copy of all the entries in the first hash table and putting it into the second, second hash table. And depending on what you're actually using your hash table for, this may be a bad thing because you're maybe trying to process queries that are updating the table at the same time you're trying to rebuild it and you, do, you know, may end up losing entries if, if you're not careful. Question? Yes. Right, see, so in this case here, for inserting Z, right, we have two locations. Right. Uh, so my question is, so, there are two, so let's say if we find a cycle after n evictions, so there are two to the power n possible choices we could have made. So do they rebuild the hash table after checking all the two to the power n? So, there, his, so, here, his, so his question is, in this case here, uh, I, I need to insert Z, and I decided to evict Y. But if I end up evicting X, it may end up with a different combination of evictions and then that may not have a cycle. Um, good question. Uh, so I think probably what they do for simplicity of you know, software engineering, instead of flipping a coin, you could just pick, I'm always going to try to evict from this side and don't worry about uh, you know, the, the, other, the other path. Right, I think in general that's it's it's that makes it too complicated to say. All right, I went down this way this first this first time. Now I want to go down the second way. Right, most of the time you just flip a coin. Okay, and if you come back around, then that's good enough. Actually, I don't have a link, but the, the actual the best open source implementation of a cuckoo hash table is actually here from CMU uh, by Dave Anderson. So if you search like libcuckoo. It's, it's, it's the one written by Dave, Dave Anderson students. It's not lock free, but it's, it's pretty good. Okay, right, so again, if you, had two, if you have multiple hash functions, depending on how many, how many functions you have in your Cuckoo hash table, it'll tell you what's the likelihood you have to rebuild. Okay, so in the three previous hash table implementations that I talked about, uh, we have this problem that anytime we need to grow or shrink the hash table, we basically have to reshuffle everything, right? We basically have to, to increase the number of slots, and then when we rehash everything, 
things that used to be maybe in the same bucket or the same location now may be in different locations in the, in the new hash table. So essentially, essentially we're, we're doing a mem copy again, again of, the, of the entire contents of the table. So to avoid this, if you're using these, these three other hash, hash tables, is that you try to estimate the number of elements you're going to have ahead of time so that you don't go above this. Right? So I said this earlier in the lecture, but this, in some cases, you actually do know, you do know the, the number of things you, you want to you put in your hash table. Right? If you're doing a hash join, for example, say I have this simple query here when I would join a, table A and B, the, the join operator is just getting all the, the tuples from the, from the left side, from table A, and building a hash table on all those entries. So the database system is always going to know exactly the number of entries it has in, in each table. So you know exactly the number of elements you want to build in your hash table. It's never, it's never going to grow. It's never going to shrink. So in that case, you, you can use open addressing and not worry about uh, uh, you know, deleting things or, or, or growing too big. Right? You may still have collisions because that's based on what the hash function does and actually based on what the, actually the values are in your, in your table. But again, you'll, you'll never exceed the number of elements you have. Again, and I talked about this earlier, what's an example of another instance of a, of a hash table in a database system where you may not know the number of, of entries? Again, you guys are building this in the first project, right? The, the, the page directory in your buffer pool manager, right? I, there's nothing preventing the application from just keep inserting things over and over again, and you increase the number of pages you have. So when you, the, the database system first turns on, there's nothing in it. Right? So the, the number of elements it has is zero. The page directory is, is essentially zero. But then over time, it, it, it gets big. So question, yes? Does like, muting in high table refers to like, uh, encrypting the side of the table? Is it possible to like, solve the collisions by simply adding a new table, a new function? So his statement is, uh, Let's say you don't you don't need to increase the size of the of the hash table. You don't increase the number of element entries you're trying to store. That you just want to reduce the number of collisions. So therefore, you choose a different hash function to to sort of randomly permeate the the, the different entries. Oh, is that what you're talking about for cuckoo hashing? Or? So his, his question is, uh, when I go, say I, I first build my cuckoo hash table with two hash tables. And then uh, I get, I have, it gets too full. So then I dynamically, you know, when I rebuild, then I want to say, instead of maybe growing it, I just pick a third hash function, a third hash table, and maybe that reduces the, the number of collisions. Uh, yeah, so, so I suppose you could do that. I, I don't actually know what the libcuckoo actually does. I think it always just doubles the size of, of the hash table when you, when, you, when you get too big, right? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, 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 we should talk to Dave about that. I don't, I, don't, I don't know what they actually do. Okay. So, again, all, not all your hash tables will be, will be statically sized. Some of them will actually grow and shrink. And so to handle this, you want to use what are called dynamic hash tables that can grow and shrink the, the, the size of the, the hash table on demand, right? So we'll first talk about extendable hashing, and then, which is, is in the textbook. And then we'll talk about linear hashing, which is another approach, which I don't think is in the textbook, but is, is, is actually in, in older versions, other versions of, of database textbooks that are covered in other classes. OK. so. With extendable hashing, the way to think about it is that it's going to be like chain hashing where we have buckets. Um, but instead of letting the linked list of buckets per slot in our, in our lookup or, or offset array, instead of letting those bucket lists grow indefinitely, what will happen is that we're going to split them incrementally. right? And just, do, just reorganize the entries of the bucket we want to split. 
All right, so then instead of having again reshuffle the entire table, we'll sort of have a localized chain change to our uh, to just the one that gets too big. So again, lo let's look at an entry here. So our example. So here I have uh, four slot offsets, and then I have uh, three buckets. So the first thing is that we have this thing called the global counter. And the global counter is going to tell us the number of bits in our hash function output that we want to use to figure out the location of a key that we're looking for. All right, so again, think of the hash function. Just, the most simplest thing is take an integer representation of the key, mod it by the number of offsets in our array, and then that'll give you uh, a, a, a location. And then we see now in our, the, the, the offsets point to three different buckets. Then each bucket is going to maintain what's called the local counter. And this corresponds to what, how many bits in the hash output, the hash key, that w was used to get to th this particular bucket. So in this case here, for, the, for the, the, the guy at the top, the local counter is one. That means that it only uses, you only have to use the, uh, one bit in the beginning of the hash key to find that location. So here, the, the global counter is two, but the, the local counter is one, so we're just using the zeros here in the first bit location. So that's why 00, zero and zero, 01 both map to the same bucket. Because this bucket hasn't gotten full yet, and we haven't split it. Now in the case of the other two buckets, their local counters are two, which matches the global counter, and that's telling us we need to use two bits to figure out how to, to get to that particular bucket. OK? So let's look at an example now. Say I want to find x, and we run x through our hash function, and it produces some, some bit sequence. And so we look at our global counter. Our global counter says that we need to look at two bits. And so we look at the first two bits in the hashed output, and then that will direct us to uh, 0, 1. And then again, we just follow the pointer, and that takes us to, to the bucket that has the, our entry. Yes? Does it matter if you look at the most significant or least significant bits? His question is whether you look at the most significant or least significant bit. It does not matter. You just need to be consistent in your implementation. I think the textbook does uh, from left to right, right? Um, other, other examples online will go right to left. It doesn't matter. All right, so let's say I want to insert y. And again, y hash it to some, some bit sequence. We look at our global counter. Our global counter says two bits. So we'll use the first two bits to map to some offset here. And then we go ahead and insert our entry. All right? Now I want to insert z. Same thing. First two bits, all right? It ends up hashing to this location here. But we see that our bucket is now is full. So we don't actually want to uh, so, so we're going to go ahead and uh, split this and now set the global counter to 3. So essentially what happens here, now we're going to double the size of our directory, now include 3 bits to correspond to the offset in, in, each, in each slot, and we are going to reshuffle the entries of the bucket that we end up splitting. And so now the global counter is 3 because we have two buckets where the local counter is now three. But we still have the bucket from at the top that has the, global, the local counter one, and then this, the bucket at the bottom has a local counter two. Right? Those are unchanged after we did the split. I'm seeing confused faces. Any questions? What's that? His, his question is, it may be the case that splitting once may not be enough. Uh, <laughs> correct, because you may end up splitting, right. So in, this, in my example here, in, you know, you're going to split this guy here. So you have one zero, you know, first, the first two bits, when the, when the global counter is two, they're all the same. It's all one zero. Uh, the entry that now I'm, I'm inserting, all right, if you go to three bits, the first entry here is 101, the second one is 100, the next guy is 101. So in that case, yes, they would end up getting split into, uh, into separate ones, and there'll be a free slot where I insert the new entry. 
the uh, it may be the case at the third when you have three bits they're still all the same. You go to four bits they're still all the same. So you may end up keep splitting over and over again to find actually some point where they're actually all distinct, right? Uh, in the simple case, we don't worry about that. But yeah, it's just recursive operation. In the back, yes. What exactly is the function of the local counter? The, the function of the local counter is just sort of internal metadata to say. Uh, if I, you know, when I, when I want to split this, uh, how many bits now should I use in my hash function to reassign the entries to the tuples, right? So in this case here, I only look at zero one. Say now if I go to the local bit, to, local counter to two, I now need to consider two bits and assign them to buckets that way. Yes? When you extend the, the table on the left, that means that you would need to instantiate an entirely new table and be all of the functions. Correct. So his statement is here I double the size of the directory and I need to instantiate pointers to now point, you know, to, to, to the potentially new locations of the buckets. You're correct. Uh, but in general, this is, you know, it's a mem copy, but it's not, it's not like we're copying all the buckets. That's, that's usually the most expensive thing. This is just 64-bit pointers, just an array. So to make a copy of that and then, uh, you know, atomically have it be now the master uh, array for this hash table is not a big deal. Copying buckets and the actual key and values inside of them is, is the more expensive operation. But that's a good point. Yes. Okay. So, uh, Again, the extendable hashing is, in my opinion, it's pretty straightforward. Again, the, the key thing is that the, you always want to look at the bits in that, you know, that you're hashing on to, to figure out where they go, um, in this, always in the same direction. Uh, in, your, in the first project, I'm not saying worry, don't worry about, I say don't worry about shrinking the, the hash table, only worry about growing it. Shrinking it is, uh, essentially a bit more complicated, you basically have to recognize that you have a, uh, a bucket that now is empty and then you can have the, you basically subtract the, the local counter to reduce it to say the number of bits you, sh you should look at and then you map whatever slot array it is uh, that, that's pointing to it to now point to an another bucket. And if you're trying to do this in a more sophisticated manner using sort of low-level latches instead of actually a giant mutex for that entire hash table, getting the ordering of those operations can be tricky. So we decided to not have you guys worry about that for the first assignment. Yes? Say it again? Correct, yeah, I'm, I'm only showing the key here, yes. Okay, so the, the problem with extendable hashing is that the, uh, occasionally you're, you're doubling the size of the directory. And again, I said it's not that big of a deal because it's just 64-bit pointers, but at some point, you know, it's, it's exponential, and you may end up doubling it to be a, a really large size. Um, and that means that the way you do this sort of atomically, you, you have to take a read-write latch on the array anytime you access it because you don't know if another thread could be you know, doubling the size of it and reshuffling things. So with, with linear hashing, the idea is that we're going to try to be a bit more smooth, I'll put, use that word in quotes, but we'll sort of gradually increase the size of our, of our uh, offset array uh, by s splitting things incrementally. And so the way we're going to do this is that we're going to maintain a, a separate pointer that's going to keep track of the next bucket we want to split. And every time we, we have a, a, a bucket gets, gets too full, then we'll split whatever the thing is pointing at, even if it's not the actual thing that, that got overflowed, and we'll split that, move the pointer down, and keep proceeding until we reach the end. Then we loop back around and do the same process all over again. So in linear hashing, the the criteria or the, the decision about when a bucket is considered too full and you want to, it's overflowed, um, is it left up to actually how you want to implement it, right? So it could be based on space utilization, it could be the length of the overflow chains, right? 
it's up to you to decide what you want to use, uh, what, what method you want to use to decide now's the time to go ahead and do a split. So let's walk through an example here. So here I have now, uh, we don't keep track of any local counters. The only thing that we maintain is this extra split pointer that's going to, again, point to the next bucket we want to split whenever any bucket in our hash table overflows. Right? And so, like in cuckoo hashing now, we're also going to have multiple hash functions. In the very beginning, the split pointer is pointing to the, at the, at the, first, at the first offset in our array, so we only need one hash function. But as we see as we go along, you actually end up having two of them. So let's say if I want to do, I want to do find on five. Uh, for this, again, just run it through our hash function and say for simplicity reasons, we'll say this is just the integer representation of the key mod by the number of entries we have. So in this case here, it's six mod four, and that gives us to two. And then we can jump down and find, find our entry in, the, in the, the third bucket there. So now I want to insert 17, uh, but when we hash it, we end up pointing to this bucket here. Um, but that bucket is full. So instead of splitting this bucket, we're going to just add an overflow bucket. And we'll maintain that linked list that we saw in the chain hashing, which is extended out the number of entries we have for, for this slot location. But then we'll end up splitting whatever the split pointer is pointing at. Right? So in this case here, it's pointing to the first one. So what we'll do is we'll make a uh, new slot entry uh, and use a, new, use a second hash function, which is now the doubling the number of elements we're modding the, the key by. And that's going to end up reshuffling all the entries in, the, in that first bucket to have some of them point to the first bucket and some of them point to our new bucket. In this case here, 8 stays at the top, 20 comes to the bottom. And again, we have the same problem that he mentioned before is that we may end up put still, based on what hash function we're using, if we have a bad hash function, we may end up still putting everything in that first bucket. Um, but in this case here, that's fine. Because we don't care because in this case, the, the first bucket didn't actually overflow anyway. So it doesn't matter. All right, so now I have two hash functions. So now if I want to do a find on 20, when I apply the first hash function, it ends up mapping to the first slot slot zero. But now because I know that I've actually done a split and the split pointer is not no longer pointing to the first location, I need to check to see whether the first hash function is mapping to a slot that has come before the, the, the current location of the split pointer. You think of the split pointer as sort of a threshold in your offset array that says anything below this has not been split yet, so therefore I, I still can use the first hash function. Anything above this has been split, so I actually need to apply the, the second hash function. So now in this case here, for find 20, again, it maps to the first location using the first hash function, the first slot. So therefore, I know I'm, I'm, I'm below or above the, the split pointer location, so now I need to apply the second hash function, and then that will map, be, map me down to this slot here, and then I can find the entry that I'm looking for. Again, this keeps going. If, if, um, if, another, if another bucket overflows, I'll apply the same, uh, same split operation. I, still, I only keep the second hash function, and I move the split pointer down. And I keep doing this over and over again. Then at some point, uh, you'll reach position three, which is sort of the end of the original slot array, like this. Once I reach point three, I, I, I would have extended down the, the directory for all the other buckets I had to split to get there. Then I loop back around, res reset the split pointer, delete the first hash function, and start over again and apply the same operation. Question? Uh, whenever we split a bucket, we need to rehash all the uh, buckets above the split pointer, right? His question is, when you, when you split a bucket, do you rehash anything that's above it? No, you only rehash whatever the split pointer is pointing at. Because the second hash function that comes along would have already been applied to any bucket that came up before it. And the hash function is going to say, in this case here, it's 2n, it's either going to be the, the first location or the, the, the new location. Every time you split, do you need a new hash function? 
This question is, every time you split, do you need a new, new hash function? No. You always have the second hash function that's created the first time you split, right? And that's always going to be the second hash function no matter how many more times you split. But then when you reach the bottom and you loop back around the top, you delete the first hash function and, and just use the second one as the main one. Okay. So, uh, right, again, so, so this seems odd, right? This seems like not the right thing to do because in my example, the, the bucket that got overflowed is not the one that ended up splitting. I ended up splitting one that was, was not full at all. Uh, but in practice, this works out because you don't need to maintain some extra metadata to say, here's the, you know, here's hash function for this thing that's been split, here's a separate hash function for, for the other one that has not been split. The math works out that as long as you're below that, that if you haven't been split yet by the split pointer, then you can still apply that same hash function and you don't have to reshuffle everything. So you're re only reshuffling things incrementally, right? And eventually, uh, you will, the, the split pointer will, will cover all the, the buckets and all the, th the thing that may be causing all your overflows will get split and then you can loop back around and do it again. So again, it seems not like it's not doing the obvious thing, but it's, it's it, the trade-off for not splitting the thing that overflowed immediately when it overflows is that there's less metadata and there's less overhead of actually trying to figure out where something's located. So linear hashing is a clever idea. I think it was developed in the early 1980s. Um, and I think it's used in quite a number of systems. So if the pointer can also move actually in the reverse direction, so say you have a bucket that gets is essentially empty, then you can go ahead and coalesce it and move the split pointer back up. All right. All right. So in the remaining time, uh, I want to talk about hash functions. So all everything that I talked about here today, and I think somebody brought this up earlier in the semester, doesn't work at all if you have a terrible hash function. Right? The worst possible hash function you can have is just take any number and you know the hash is zero. Right? Every possible key will hash to the same value. That's the worst possible thing you can do. Uh, so you want something that's going to be have a low collision rate, meaning different keys that are completely distinct will unlikely to get mapped to the, the, the same value. So the key thing to point out too also is that when we say hash function, we don't necessarily, we're not even talking about cryptographic hashing like SHA-1 or SHA-256, right? Because we don't actually need to reverse any of the keys after they've been hashed. In these cryptographic hashes, you do actually want to do that, right? Because if someone sends you a crypt, uh, you know, uh, encrypted message, you need to be able to decrypt it. So in our cases, we just want to get some random bits for any, any arbitrary string. So we're not talking about things that you would use for a cryptography. So that means that we want to make this thing be really fast. And again, we want that low, low collision rate. So I, you know, if you take an algorithms class or, or a, uh, sorry, it's a class that covers hash functions, they'll talk about the math of how these things actually work. From a database perspective, we don't care. Uh, we'll just take whatever actually works. So there's, these are the four probably most popular or well-known hash functions that are out there today that uh, at least the newer systems are using. Things like Postgres, SQL Server, and, and you know, DB2 and Oracle, if you actually look in their code, at least, at least Postgres you can do this, they all implement their, their own custom hash function. Uh, but most of the newer systems that are out today or that have been come out in the last you know, 10 years, they're probably using one of these. So murmur hash was sort of the first hash function that got notoriety that was designed to be this sort of fast general purpose hash function you can use in these hash tables. And then the Google guys in 2011 basically took the second version of murmur hash um, and optimized it to, to work better for shorter keys. So the first murmur hash was written by, I think, just some random dude on the internet, right? Um, and then people started picking up it, picked it up, and said, oh, well, this is really good. This actually solves the problem we, we, we wanted. So the Google guys took it, and then they sort of tweaked it to handle keys that are less than 64 bytes because that was a particular use case that they cared about in their systems. Then in 2014, the Google guys came up with a newer version of CityHash called FarmHash uh, that had even better collision rates. And then there's a, 
newer hash function that was written by a professor in, in up in Canada called CL hash. Um, I don't know where this is actually being used just yet, uh, and I'll, I'll show some numbers in the next slide. Um, what's actually very interesting about this is that they rely on what's called carry less multiplication, which is a, a different way of doing arithmetic to compute these hashes, which I think is kind of interesting. So that's the link to the Wikipedia article if you want to learn about it. So in this slide here, this is actually a benchmark framework that I ran a year or two ago uh, that compares a bunch of different hash functions for computing uh, hashes for different key sizes. And the way to read this is that the, the, the y-axis is measuring the, num the amount of data that they can hash and co compute hashes from. This is, we're not measuring collision rates here, just how fast can they, they hash things. And so, and then along the, the, the x-axis is the, the size of the keys that, that they're hashing. Think of this as like the number of random characters in, in a string. And so, in this we're comparing against STD hash, which you guys are again, using for your, your first project, against Murmur hash 3, Google city hash, and farm hash. And I'll show CL hash in the, in the next slide. So what you see is that Murmur hash and STD hash essentially plateau uh, right around here in the middle, and they're essentially doing the same. In the case of STD hash, you sort of see this sawtooth pattern, all right, where it sort of it gets faster and then gets slower, it gets faster and gets slower for, as the keys get bigger. In the uh, case of farm hash and city hash, you see a very interesting pattern where the it spikes up, goes down, spikes up, goes down, and then it changes the the, the sawtooth pattern. It becomes more elongated as you go along. Do you want me to take a guess what these spikes correspond to? Byte boundary. boundary, exactly right. So this is, the first spike is 32, 32 bytes, then 64, 128, 192. Why is it doing this? I also say too, this is all in memory, right? We're not reading anything from disk, this is just taking in memory string, hashing it, and producing a hash value. Why does it do this? I was wondering, like, if the SIMD is being used. The question is, is SIMD being used? Uh, I think for these, yes. Why? Because it takes time to, like, you know, CPU would have to, like, uh, just split them to find all three. That's the case of keys to have the dense, you have to, like, yeah. There's two ways to do that. The first one is to, like, to in half, to expand to, like, 16 bits, so that it's quite long. But the downside is that it will waste all of the space and extra, thus incurs extra items. And the second thing, <coughs> To, well, it's a little bit tricky to use a, like, compressive magic. Right, okay. So let me, let me try to restate what he says. So uh, the CPUs want to store data, or they, they prefer to operate on data that is called word aligned, meaning they sort of fit the boundaries of, of either registers or cache lines or, uh, or it, 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 individual, you know, individual SIMD registers. We won't talk about SIMD in this class, we'll cover it in the advanced class. But essentially what happens is like, again, it's measuring the throughput and the amount of data it can process. So at these different, uh, at these peaks, you're able to pack in exactly uh, data that aligns with the registers that the, the processor is going to use to invoke these special instructions that can crunch data in parallel. So that's why you get these, these sort of spikes at, at these offsets here. And then what happens is these registers are only so big, so when you get to the larger, uh, larger key sizes, then you can't pack as many keys in the same, uh, you know, not, not, you're not processing multiple keys at the same time, you're processing different sections of the same key at the same time. So you can't pack as much data into these SIMD operators, and that's why you see, um, you see this, this up and down become longer here. Again, I said before in the last slide, uh, in the case of farm hash, they optimized it for, or in city and farm hash, they optimize it for things that are less than 64 bits, and that's why you see they're much, much faster than all these other ones, because that's sort of like the, the best case scenario for these hash functions. So now we throw CL, CL hash in, uh, and these are the same, the same results for the other hash functions in the last slide, but now I've just changed the y-axis. With this CL hash function, uh, it's slower in the beginning, but then when you get to lo much larger keys, it actually does much better. Right? And you sort of see this again, the same sawtooth pattern corresponds to uh, things being, whether they're, they're word aligned or not. 
So this is the link here to, uh, again, some random dude on the internet wrote a little microbenchmark framework that takes all these hash functions and runs this, these experiments so you can regenerate these graphs if you want. And then I sent him a patch to actually run the, the CL hash one um, to throw it in, in the mix. Okay? So, uh, hash tables, again, everyone should, should be aware of what they are. They're really great because they allow us to do 01 lookups in some cases. Uh, but typically, hash tables are not what we're going to want to use when we actually talk about database indexes or table indexes. Um, and this is because uh, compared to, to, to the tree data structures we'll talk about on Wednesday, they're not going to allow us to do range scans and other operations um, where you may not be looking for an, an, an exact key. Right? And this is what an over-preserving tree can actually do for you. So in the remaining time, what I'll do is I'll, I'll just give a quick demo of uh, this in Postgres. Which I think been disconnected though. Awesome. <coughs> Which may not be happening. Hold up. Um. Okay, so I have a simple table that has a, uh, what is that? Two, 27 million email addresses from a well-known Canadian uh, dating website. Uh, <laughs> if you follow the news, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so we have 27 million unique email addresses. So what we can do is, uh, we can build in, in Postgres, when you create your index, you can specify, I'll just write from scratch, right, create index, uh, IDX emails, you can specify that you wanted to build a hash index, right, by default without this, Postgres is always going to build, give you a B plus tree, but if I say, if I'm using hash, if I add that keyword in, it tells me that, the, you're, I'm telling the data system I want to use a hash function or hash table. Or not, all right. All right, I'm, right, on emails using hash. I think this, this should take about 14 seconds. Everything should be in the buffer pool. So again, with a, with a hash index, I can only do uh, single key lookups. I can only find entries that, where I have an exact match. I'm not going to be able to do, uh, to scan, um, to, to do range scans, or do uh, other kind, kind of predicates. What's, what's that? His question is, is it possible to use... Do, um, you ha so... So, sorry, so his statement is, if the data is naturally clustered, then... Uh, no, no, hold up, hold up. Yeah, hold on, so... so, so I'm talking about, can you use the hash table to do range scans? And the answer is no. Because the hash function randomly reassigns them in different locations. So even if everything got inserted in sorted order, the hash table jumbles that. Okay. All right, so I built my hash table now. Uh, so if I go, so this is, if you, if I ran this before, and this is looking up the guy. This is, this is the, uh, Somebody register an account with this email address. So this is, alphabetically, this is the last email, right? So again, I can run explain, and explain tells me that uh, what, how it's going to execute my plan. 
So here you can see that it's telling me it's going to do an index scan using that hash table I just built as my index, right? So now when I actually do the lookup for it, um, right, it comes back really, really fast, right? But let's say that I want to do a, um, I, do, I want to do a query where I want to find an email address that starts with Andy, right? And here you see that, again, the database system says I can't do an index scan. Even though I built that hash table index, I can't use it because uh, there has no way of actually, you know, scanning the keys, right? It's just going to scan and scan all the pages, right? So if I do this, uh, this should, I don't know how long this is going to take, we'll see. So here, they, in the data system, it says you can do a sequential scan to find the entry that I'm looking for, and there's a bunch of people, right? So now, if, let's say I build a, uh, instead of using the hash table, I can tell it to build a B tree. And this is what we're going to be talking about on, uh, on, on Wednesday. All right, so this, this might take about, uh, about a minute. W again, with these tree data structures, they're essentially going to be allow us to do, since they're preserving the order inside of the data structure itself of the keys that we're indexing, the database system is going to be able to use that to find entries that it needs for certain types of queries. So in my case here, when I was doing my lookup to say, find me all emails where the, the, the first part of the key starts with Andy, we'll be able to jump in, into the tree to some offset where all the entries that start with Andy are located, and then we can scan across the leaves to find all the elements that we want. In the hash table, we can't do that because, again, there's no mapping of, of you know, there's no easy, easy representation for the actual keys themselves. Yes? If you have both a tree and a hash table, could you use a hash table to find the first one and then scan the So his question is, if you had a, uh, both the, 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 ha the hash index, the hash table, and the B plus tree, could the database system use the hash table to find the first entry and then do what? And then jump into the, to the, to the B plus tree and find it? Yeah. How would that work? You, the value would be a pointer to a leaf node in the B plus tree? So the statement is the value in the, the hash table could then be a pointer to a location in, in the B plus tree. Uh, so think about this, like, let's talk about why this is a bad idea. The, as we'll see when we, when, when we talk about the B plus trees, the B stands for balance. They're self-balancing indexes, the meaning like as threads insert and delete entries, it's going to be splitting and merging and reorganizing the location of, of, of those pages. This is sort of an example of what I said in the beginning, there's the physical physical uh, organization of the data, the contents of, of the data structure. That's essentially where the blocks are aligned, what they're point, what's pointing to what. Then there's the logical contents. So the B plus tree could get reorganized, and now the location of different elements in it will, could change. So now I need to go figure out where the hell they actually are in my hash table to now update them, now point to the, their, their new location, right? Uh, and so, so that, that's, that would be a bad thing to do. And again, there's, there's nothing actually that the, the, the hash table is going to give us that just doing that quick scan, quick scan on the offset will do. So now if I go back here and I run that same query on explain, oh, it still wants to do a sequential scan. No, oh, never mind. <laughs> um, let's try another example. Uh, th this is because it's because it's, it's, it's a varchar, and that's probably why it's it's tripping it up. That's fine. Um, anyway, so this is a bad example, but all right. So uh, okay, so so that's it for today. Again, the the main thing I, I I'm I want trying to drive home from this example is that when you call create index in most database systems, 
you call create index in SQL, most database systems are not going to be giving you a hash table. Right? By default, they're all going to be doing B plus trees or some other order preserving tree index. And this is because uh, the, the, the hash tables are going to be really fast to do single key lookups, but when you want to do range scans, not on var charts apparently, whatever, but for other queries, it's still going to always have to do a sequential scan because the access methods that the, the, the hash table supports are only supports their equality predicates. Does something equal something? But you can't do other, other, other more complicated things. Okay? Any questions? Yes? Why does, this doesn't work? We'll find out afterwards. Okay. All right, we're done, guys. Thank you so much.